once a project ends, many things close down and we generally don't do very much long-term evaluations. Thinking about it from the target beneficiaries or participants, how to phase out, we have very limited evidence on that. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. Well, imagine there's been a successful agricultural extension program. Maybe the yields are up or farmers have learned new skills and techniques. But that help won't be provided and the inputs won't be subsidised forever. So how much of that success is sustained when an agricultural extension program is discontinued? Munshi Suleiman of Brack University is one of a team of researchers who have investigated what they call a reverse RCT in Uganda to test this question. And he joins me now. Munshi, welcome back to VoxDev Talks. Thanks, Tim. We've spoken about agricultural extensions before on VoxDev Talks, but remind us, what is a typical agricultural extension program? What does it deliver? Yeah, it can be tricky to call something typical, mm. but with that, most cases, an agriculture extension program would have an agent who advises farmers on different farming sort of practices, or sometimes we call it agronomic practices, that have evidence for better productivity that could be as simple as how to use mulching, line sowing, proper spacing. And then sometimes the agriculture extension can also include provision for access to different types of inputs in the form of high yielding varieties of seeds, can be fertilizers. And depending on the scope of the particular initiative or projects, it can also have organizing farmers into groups as farmer field schools or as producers group and link them with wholesalers for marketing services. And what is the goal of programs like this? What are they intended to achieve? The general goal is to address this problem of low productivity. So in most of these low and middle income countries, when we compare the productivity per acre, these are generally several folds lower than many other sort of advanced economies. So of course, there are certain technologies that are quite investment intensive, needs a lot of capital, but there are other things that a small scale farmer can do to improve their productivity and essentially increase their income. And sometimes this project can also have secondary or sometimes primary objective of addressing household nutritional situations, increasing their data diversity and things of that sort. Providing this help and these inputs, it must be quite an expensive intervention. Who puts up the money? I mean, the expenses can vary. From my experience with PRAC, you can find agriculture extension program where per farmer cost can be as low as $20, $30 to sometimes really expensive ones where per farmer reach can be like $100 or so that's kind of the range we mm. generally work with. So typically this investment comes in the form of more sustainable way of continuing these extension services are through government programs. So where government have their own agriculture extension services, but quite more often than not, these services are quite limited to the actual needs. So you may have an extension worker who's supposed to serve a population of several hundred thousand households. So, you know, they can only do so much. So that's when you have all of these NGOs or community-based organizations who try to take on initiatives as projects that sometimes come from multilateral donors, sometimes from foundations or bilateral donors. Now, when we've covered agricultural extension projects before, naturally, we have focused on the difference that they have made while they are being delivered. How much do we know about that by now? We actually know quite a lot because there have been many evaluations of different agriculture extension work. So some of the things that I've talked earlier, like the general sort of agronomic practices that are fairly common are you can call it somewhat universal, like mulching cannot hurt, mm. or line sowing spacing that quite universal can be adopted by 
any farmers. But there are also technologies that are very specific. So there could, could be an initiative to promote tissue culture in banana cultivation, which are more disease resistant and you know can have fruiting happening much faster, have higher income. So there are evaluations of specific technologies like that or biochar or you know, um, you know on soil health. And there are also many systematic reviews of all of these types of sort of farmer field school or extension services. So generally, we see that these initiatives end up with positive impact, at least on the particular technologies or sort of practices that they promote. So within the project or at the end of the project, you see improvement on those dimensions. Generally, we also see positive effect on household income and sort of dietary diversity of those other household level outcomes. Sometimes there's question marks. So for example, from my one of my other research in Kenya, mm-hmm. where we promoted actually banana cultivation, we saw farmers adopting this technology. They had higher income from banana. So in the end, at the end of three years, they had overall a slightly higher income. But in the interim, they had lower income because they were using land for banana cultivation that they would have otherwise used mm. for other things. So then it becomes a question of what happens in the long run. It was that sort of dip in income was worth it in the long run. Yes, tell me a little bit about the long run. What do we hope is going to happen if a time-limited program comes to an end? So the hope is twofold. The first is on sometimes as we call direct beneficiaries. So on the direct beneficiaries that the changes that we see at the end of the program continues over time and therefore it becomes the investment in the form of extension services become worth it in terms of social return through increased farmer income. But there is also sometimes hope that or expectation that some of these technologies get adopted by other farmers through demonstration, through networks of farmers. That's the long-term hope that these technologies, they continue practicing these and they continue having this higher income. Which brings us to what you're doing and you're filling a, a gap in our knowledge about what happens when these programs are discontinued. Why Don't we know more already about whether this permanent change actually occurs and what sort of change occurs? Our research, we called it reverse RCT. That is a bit (laughs) mystic, but I think that helped us to get attention a little bit. But, you know, in the published paper, we didn't use this phrasing. Mm -hmm. But essentially, when we are evaluating any social intervention, typically, most of the cases, we evaluate what is the impact of a particular intervention. So we may have a control group with one intervention or multiple treatment arms to tease out particular mechanisms or, you know, to understand what combination of intervention works. So we have evaluations done that way. And then at the end of the project period, we see what is the impact. Now, some of the evaluations, although a very small subset of those, look at really long-term effects you know, after you have implemented the intervention, you know, what's the impact a year, a season or two seasons later? You may find a few, but as you start asking about what happens after two years, three years, you see less and less evidence on that. That's because, I mean, we want to know what we are doing prospectively. Are we making a change or not? But once a project ends, many things close down. And we generally don't do very much long-term evaluations, although there are things happening on various evaluations, longer and longer term results, but that's very small minority. Okay, so let's look at this research in more detail because it certainly is long-term research. So this is an agricultural extension program in Uganda. What specific problem was this targeting? It's pretty similar to the things that I was talking earlier about uh, why we do agriculture extension. So we wanted to promote some of these better farming practices because we found from secondary data from agriculture census, we knew that some of these basic practices are not being adopted, like not being followed. So we wanted to promote these practices. But alongside, we also saw this problem of very few farmers using modern varieties of seeds of the same crops, like they grow maize, but high yielding varieties of maize. It was very limited. It goes for many other crops. So this extension program 
basically had these twofold objectives of promoting some of these basic farming practices or better farming practices and providing access to seeds, better quality seeds of high yielding varieties. And talking about that, uh, this uh, seed quality is sometimes also an issue. You, know, you can find various forms of seeds, but the quality is always not the same. And then farmers need to learn basically from a trial and error, which one works, which one doesn't. So Bragg had this social enterprise of seed production, making these seeds available to the farmers with guarantee of better quality. So in this, you made the seeds available and you made also help on how to achieve better yields? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So going into a bit details of how the program ran. So within a community, we had two cadres of community volunteers, mm -hmm. so essentially farmers. So one cadre were supported to teach other farmers on better farming practices. Okay. And we called them model farmers. So they organize them into groups, sometimes use Bragg's microfinance groups as a platform to teach them about these practices. So there's one thing about teaching where it comes to, let's say, crop rotation. So which crop should follow which crop? So there is some element of teaching, but there are also elements of just reiterating or emphasizing line sowing or spacing. Farmers know that but they don't necessarily always follow. So there's that behavioral aspects to it. So promoting as well. So encouraging and promoting, let's all do together. And then in their model farm, use that more as a demonstration where farmers can come and visit and see, okay, what happens if I actually follow some of these better practices? So that was one cadre model farmer. The other cadre, whom we called community agriculture promoter, they were trained and provided. So this is more of a quasi-commercial way of delivering seeds. So they work as agents of Brax seed mm. distribution systems so in the community. They were the sellers of Brax seeds, but not limited to Brax seeds. So they Brax didn't produce all the seeds for all types of vegetables. But we know there are trusted seed companies. We helped the distribution system that we could produce, uh, so procure in bulk and distribute to these community agriculture promoters, and then they would sell. And they are addressing two problems. One is about the quality that I've talked earlier, but the other one is also sort of accessibility. So sometimes these farms, you know, these villages are quite far away from the market centers or where you can find these certified agents or seed dealers. So making these available within the villages, we thought, could also facilitate sort of adoption of these technologies. And when it was operating, how successful was it? We have done actually a couple of impact evaluation of these models, and we did see positive impact. It's positive, but it's not transformational in the sense that uh, their productivity all of, all of a sudden doubled hmm, or yes. tripled. Yeah, it's not nothing like that. So it was typically on the margin. So for these farming practices, we saw about 10, 15 percentage points higher in the intervention group who would at follow these practices. We saw seed distribution going very well. That's something we could see just from the sales, like mm -hmm. how much seeds are being distributed through these BRAC channels. But then at the end of the day, what happened to farmers' income? So we looked at those. Within two years of these interventions, we have estimates that range between 10 to $30 of additional income from farming practices that we observe. And now we get to what you did for this paper. So this intervention was phased out, but you structured that in a way that meant that you could learn something from it. What did you do? We actually had uh, two questions. One is, so from other research, we know there's positive impact. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of it sustained? Yes. Uh, that we could also learn from those earlier research or sort of the other research projects if we could do longer term survey. But the challenge there is how long do you keep controlled villages in control and that contaminates your long term results. And BRAC is also not the only actor. Other initiatives come in. So, you know, control mm, yeah. doesn't stay control. The other one was, as I talked about these two cadres, we also wanted to know what is a better way of phasing out. So we have these two cadres. Can we take them out one by one? Which of these two cadres need to continue for longer? And then whether that has any influence on the sustainability of this initial impact during the project period. So continuing on the research design, we identify these villages where the program is going to be phased out. And instead of letting it 
phase out in whichever way program decides, we did it a little bit systematically. So we kept some villages where we continued with the intervention. And then in other villages, we discontinued either the model farmer or the community agriculture promoter. So essentially, we had a three arm design where we took out one of the two agents in two arms. In the other arm, we continued for another couple of seasons. And then we discontinued in all the villages for all the agents to see how these differences in phasing out resulted in any differences in adoption or this income and other practices. And after phase out, could the farmers still get access to the BRAC seeds? So that's actually the main results, if you like, from our study, because most of the outcomes that are related to practices, we didn't see any drop. Mm -hmm. So one way or another, farmers, more farmers were influenced by the intervention to take up these farming practices, and then they continued. It doesn't matter how we phased out. Mm -hmm. But on the seeds, we see some shift. So farmers could get access as long as we had the model farmers. But afterward, it became a market-based solution. So there was no more extension program. If the community agriculture promoters who were doing the seed distribution wanted to continue, they could continue, but that was not part of BRAC program anymore. So they were operating as independent sort of market agents. So if it made sense for them to continue the seed business, they continued. If they did not, they did not continue. Mm -hmm. So whether the farmers could access the seeds depended on whether the model farmers in their respective villages continued doing the seed business or not. But they always had this option of buying these seeds from the markets. So what happened then? You're saying that the practices continued. What about using the seeds? So we followed up up to six seasons after the phase out. So that's about three years. So that's roughly two seasons Mm -hmm. uh, in a year in Uganda. So up to six seasons, what we saw is gradually where the farmers were buying the seeds from changed. But the overall adoption of high-yielding varieties of seeds or the brands of seeds, its overall adoption changed, but the brands of seeds also changed. So over time, they were buying less and less from these original BRAC agents and they started buying from the markets. So by the time we did our last survey, six seasons after the phase out, I think about 10 to 15 percentage points drop in buying from Brax agents, but at the same time, about the same sort of magnitude of increase in buying seeds, these high yielding variety seeds, from the market. Okay, Munchi, should we be encouraged by this? Is this evidence that the Agricultural Extension Program here has delivered a permanent change and that the market can take over here but still be delivering value for farmers? Right, of course. So obviously for this particular case, we see that there is continuation of this impact, even though the interventions are discontinued. So that's encouraging. And also we see that the particular way we uh, sort of discontinued or phased out also didn't matter much. Mm. But also the program ran for about three, four years until we reached that phase out Mm. space. So overall for agriculture extension, this is definitely a positive news that we see this longer term effect and our way we phased out didn't matter much. But I think there's additional lesson or direction that this research intends to promote. And there is one limitation. Mm -hmm. So on the direction, I'd say about this phase out, this is something as I've seen in many NGOs that I've worked with or have interacted with, this is always as part of the discussions or at the beginning of the project, like what's the project cycle, how we'll close down all of that. But when it comes to closing, it is usually based on the finances that are available and how you phase out your stuff, those practicalities. Mm. But thinking about it from the target beneficiaries or participants, how to phase out, we have very limited evidence on that. So, So, you know, for different projects or different interventions, different mode of phase out can have different impact on the sustainability. So that's kind of a general direction we we think needs to be looked at. But one limitation is, so one can think, okay, so we have done this uh, agriculture extension, they have adopted, it's continuous, and then maybe other farmers will 
follow these practices irrespective of that spillover effect or not. This is great news. So therefore, we're done with those villages. But that's not the case, right? So we talked about a few of these practices that continued. But there are many other things that we need to do before we really see a big change in farm productivity, harvesting twice as much as they're doing right now, or three times or five times. So there is need for uh, many other interventions and there the phase out can differ. In my experience, and I'm also a little bit farmer myself, with the climate change, this is becoming even more important because uh, we need to, the farmers essentially need to be on their toes because what is working now may not work in five years. And a technology that we're promoting may have good results now will not necessarily have the good results five years. But sometimes really old technologies now in the context of climate change, we need to reinvent and sort of remind ourselves and adopt those. So I guess the limitation is this shows the, the continuity of impact, but this does not mean that we're done with agriculture extension. <laughs> but being able to show that continuity of impact, surely that means that the case for agricultural extensions in general in a world where resources are limited, that case is now stronger. Absolutely, yes. So any typical cost-benefit analysis of any social program would assume how long the impact sustains. And mm -hmm. there are only a handful of things that you can think of where this with this benefit cost ratio will be more than one, meaning you get more than at least a dollar for one dollar investment within the project period. Yeah. So most of this assumes some longer term impact or sustaining some of this initial impact. So from that perspective, I think it does give evidence that agriculture extension is worth the investment. I can imagine donors would want to provide the maximum behavior change for the minimum investment. Can we use techniques like this to try and work out how long it takes to change behavior sustainably? Is that going to be possible? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's going in into the optimizing of interventions. Mm. Sometimes they call it maybe dosage. So how long, how many times within a period? There are sort of research coming up that are trying to look into this from my sort of experience I know in the area of soft skills training. There is a lot of focus on, you know, you need to train for how many hours or how many days and for how many months. So all those sorts of variations in how many modules. So this dosage continuity of intervention are being done. But to my knowledge, not so much in the agriculture extension space. And I suppose my other speculation is, could, when you have a program running, use techniques like this to work out whether or not it is time to start winding it up? Is that possible? Absolutely, yes. The shorter the duration of intervention, the better. And as I said earlier, mm. we have this context that this program was running for quite some time, yes. so three, four years. So maybe that's why, you know, which way we phase out didn't matter. But had it been just after two years, we probably would have could have seen a different result of, you know, maybe the promoters were more important than the model farmers or vice versa. I guess you answer one question that opens up, yeah. you know, three more new questions. <laughs> but yeah, that's the knowledge journey. Well, I look forward to finding out what the answers are. Munchi Suleiman, a researcher and sometimes farmer. Thank you very much. Thank you too. The paper is called Can Agricultural Extension and Input Support Be Discontinued? Evidence from a Randomized Phase-Out in Uganda. And the authors are Ram Fishman, Stephen Smith, Vida Bobic and Munshi Suleiman. This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You will find us there. And if you do miss an episode, all the past episodes, as always, are at voxdev.org, where you will also find articles on the papers we feature.